Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to be with you. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, the sun's better. It was a little tinny before. I'm going to keep it this way. Hallelujah. I believe we have lesson 17. Lesson 17. Oh, I have a water man now. The water boy. Ew. <laughs> we want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you tonight. And it's good to have you with us. We're just uh, goofing a little bit here tonight. And uh, thank God Sister Vicky came through the operation wonderfully. And we're keeping her in prayer to recover quickly. And uh, we're so glad for that. Tonight's lesson is on the moral principle of interpretation. Uh, we're going to be talking about that tonight. So if you have your Bibles, get ready. Um, I'm going to be sharing some scriptures with you um, and what it is. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Thank you for the faithfulness of your people that come out every Wednesday to hear your word, to be taught of your word, so that they can go back and learn how to properly interpret the Bible so that they can hear your voice clearly and know that it's you. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for their willingness to come after long day's work and everything that they do. And so, Father, we ask a blessing upon them, and we ask a blessing upon tonight and upon your word as it goes forth. Let it accomplish the things you want it to accomplish in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen and amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. What is the moral principle or what is the mor what is the moral principle of biblical interpretation? Well, it is the principle of interpretation that assists the interpreter in extracting timeless truths from the passage under consideration and here's an important part and applying them to our contemporary world. So if you have your Bibles uh, we'll see that it is implied in several New Testament scriptures tonight. Amen. God bless you, Brother Joe. I, I texted you. I said, where, you, where are you, bro? <laughs> Amen. G good to see you. Uh, praise God. Hallelujah. I saw an accident on uh, 128, and I said, oh, man, Joe's going to get caught in traffic. I said, Wait a minute. He doesn't go to 128 no more. <laughs> praise God. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting with verse 5 to 11. We're going to read that, and I'm going to read that to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 to 11. I'm going to get a little, just a little bit of water here. Praise the Lord. It says, but with most of them, right? Am I, am I in the right one? Yep. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, if you notice, this scripture is talking about something that happened in the past, right? Okay, it's, it's, it's taken into an account of an Old Testament uh, story. And then verse 6 says, Now these things were our examples to the intent, oh, let me read it from what I have here, to the intent that we should, that we should. So it's, it's calling for action, right? Those things were written for a foretime, were written for our examples, to the intent or that we should not lust after the th evil things that as they also lusted. Well, what did they lust for? Well, you have to go back and look at it, right? You have to go back in the context of when this story was given in the Old Testament and read it because he's given an inference to that. And then he says... Lust after those things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters. So what is he saying here? He's saying here, look, don't let the culture that you're living in, this is something how we can take the moral, uh, the moral um, principle and apply it to our life today. Don't let what they did, their culture, or don't let your culture corrupt you. See, because our culture now says things that are so anti-biblical, right? And they say that things are, uh, they approve of things 
that the Bible doesn't approve of. And because it's our culture, many times we cave into that and we kind of accept that. And so what happens is he's saying here to them, he says, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down, they ate, they drank, and they rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. What are the principles we can learn from this? What are the moral principles that we can take from that? We can take from those things, uh, even to the point where it says, you know, uh, the don't complain. What did they complain about? Do you remember? Yes. Exactly. They weren't satisfied with what God provided. And see, we can fall into that same category today because we have all these prosperity preachers on television telling you that you need to be prosperous and if you don't have... You know, if you don't have the new car and the new home and all this other stuff, and, and God's not blessing you. That's not true. Can I get a good amen somewhere? Thank you. Okay, I thought I was alone here. I was like, wow. <laughs> okay. Uh, but, you know, uh, those things that uh, um, um, God wants us to uh, not partake in, culture says it's okay. So we cannot let culture dictate to us our moral principles. We have to... Let the Bible dictate to us our moral principle. Amen? Praise God. Now, all these things, verse 11. Now, all these things. Well, let me go back one minute because I'm looking at that word destroyer. Uh, go back to that other scripture for me, will you please? He says, and, and neither murmur at you as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. When we begin to murmur and complain about our situations, that releases, I believe this, that releases, God says, you know, you're not, you're not appreciating the blessings I've, I've supplied for you, and you're longing and lusting after the things that you, you know, know. And if you start complaining about things, and, and I was sharing this with somebody the other day, I said, uh, I was talking to him about something, uh, maybe it was today, I think it was today, <clears throat> I said, you know, Joe, as often as, he, as often as he commuted to Boston every day, getting up at 3, 4, 3.30, 4 o'clock, whatever it was, getting, getting dressed, getting you know, his food together, getting out there for four, 5 o'clock in the morning to catch that bus, never complained. Got on the bus, rode all the way to, all the way to South Station in Boston, got off, the, got off there in the pouring rain and snow and sleet and all that stuff, went down to the, the, the uh, uh, T, got on the T all the way to where he had to go and then walk a block and a half to where he worked and didn't complain. But just thank God he had a job and begin to, you know, bless God for what he had. Look what God did for him two years later. Come on, somebody. That's a blessing. See, God will bless you when you're satisfied with what he gives you. You know, there's something in the scripture like that, too, isn't it? Yes, Sister Lucy. Yes, to be content. To whatever state you find yourself in, to be there with content. Because contentment, godliness with contentment is great gain. And how it's great gain is that God sees you're not covetous. You're not, you're not you know, doing it for those things, for objects and, and materialistic things. And God knows your heart now and you're a giver and you're, you're, you're planting and you're sowing and you're doing all those stuff. And God sees that you're not covetous because a covetous person is not content. Susie got a new car, I got to have a new car. Susie got a new home, I got to have a new home. This one got this, I got to have that. Okay? No. When you're content, God sees you're not covetous, and when you're not covetous, God blesses you with more. Amen? And the more that God gives you, the more you give away. I remember one time, I just want to kind of interject this because it kind of fits good morally as, as a principle. Uh, one time, uh, I give everything away. And Linda will tell you, and I'm not saying that to boast, that's, I, I'm just that type of person that I'll give you the shirt off my back. And one time uh, uh, I gave my whole week's pay to somebody that was in need. And my wife was like, hey, you got to stop this. Okay? She says, I'm taking over the finances. 
And she took over the finance. I think it was maybe about two or three weeks later. She came back. She threw it at me. She said, here, you can do it again. <laughs> you can do it. I don't know how, how all this money goes out, but it does. And God blesses us. And it gets done. Amen. You know, praise the Lord. See, but when you, when you hoard it and you, you know, this is mine and mine is me and mine is all mine. Guess what? God can't bless you. But when you release it, right, when you release it and you give, God will give back to you, right? Okay, uh, Bobby, you want to hand out those $100 pledge cards I gave you? No. I'm only kidding. All right. Oh, you want to be the first one? No. <laughs> yes. A cup of cold water in his name. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought I was gonna. I'm gonna go sit down a few minutes. And let you come up and preach. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. Let's get back to the Bible study. But anyway, but you see the idea of what I'm trying to get at, right? So when you do these things, these things were written for our example, for our learning. To learn something isn't just to have information. Okay. To learn something is when you when you get the information and you process the information. That information brings you to a decision point, and with that decision point, you make a choice. Either you're going to do it, or you're not going to do it. And that's when you really have true understanding. And God's wisdom, when we ask God for wisdom, he gives us the wisdom to know what way to, imply, to apply that to our heart and life. Amen? Okay. And let me go on here. Now, now, everything that occurred in the Old Testament era has been preserved for us in the Bible. There's things that were written in history that are not in the Bible. God didn't write all of history, and that, that Bible would have volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of all the history that took place. But he wrote those things that were important enough to, to us to know how to act, what to do, what to believe. Amen? And that's sufficient. We don't have to know everything. I mean, some people do, but, you know, I, I don't have a big enough brain to know everything. So, um, anyway, let's look at John uh, chapter 21, verse 24 and 25. All right, this is the disciple who testifies of these things. And wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, he says, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Okay. Now, how many understand? I know a couple will. I know probably Brother Bob will because he's had some of this teaching. How many of you know what a hyperbolic expression is? Okay, Brother Tom knows. A hyperbolic expression. You're going, what, the, what is a hyperbolic expression? A hyperbole or a hyperbolic expression is an exaggeration without the intent to deceive. Okay. Now, Jesus lived 33 years. Trust me, there's no way he could have filled all the books in the world Hello? With things that he did. It would be impossible. Okay. He'd have to be up 24-7, okay, every single minute, every single day, doing a miracle, 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 doing this, doing this, for all the books. This is what's called a hyperbolic expression. It's an exaggeration without any intent to deceive to show the immensity of who he was. Follow me? So you can't take that to the, literally and say, well, it's all, yeah, when there's not enough... Room in the world for all the things that Jesus did in the 33 years he was here. Not necessarily true. Okay. He wrote those things that he wants us to know, and it's called the Bible. Okay. Besides, if, he, if there was all those volumes, we don't even get the Bible down yet. <laughs> right? So what would we do with all those volumes? What home could hold all those volumes? It would be impossible. Not everything that Jesus did in his life on earth is recorded for us in the New Testament. However, that which has been given to us is for the purpose of teaching us 
in the way of salvation. What to do, how to obtain that salvation, how to grow, what's the necessary things that we need to grow. Let, let me give an example, um, which I, I'm reminded that Joe was supposed to come by and water that tree for me with that stuff. What's it called? The stuff you mix with the water? What is it? Say it slow so I can hear you. He goes, it's a ta 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 I'm like, hydroponic nutrient solution, okay? Well, he told Nelson about it, and Nelson was like, well, what's that? And he says, well, here, I'll show you. And he, he used some of it on his plants and stuff, right? You had all kinds of tomatoes, all kinds. It helped grow everything, right? Okay. Well, the same way with God's word. When you interpret it correctly and you apply it, guess what? It's going to cause growth. Okay? And when you don't see growth, maybe they ought to get some of that stuff and drink it. <laughs> okay? So that it can produce, you know, get you to produce. That's what God wants us to do, is to produce. Amen? Romans chapter 15, verse 4. Romans 15, verse 4. For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. If you don't read your Bible, you're not getting comfort. And through the patience of the scriptures, patience and comfort of the scriptures, you might have hope. Some Christians don't have any hope because they don't read their Bibles. They don't know the word. You get that word inside of you, okay, and you patiently wait on God and the things that he has for you, and the scriptures will bring you comfort. I know there were many times that I went through things and I would read a scripture and it would just comfort me and strengthen me and I'd say, God, thank you. Thank you. I remember one time I was complaining when we first started the ministry and we only had one or two people. <laughs> Think about this, only one or two people with us besides me and my wife. And I was like, Lord, you know, why? What's, wrong? You know, what's going on? And then he gave me that scripture, despise not the days of small beginnings. I was like, okay, all right. Thank you, Jesus. You know, he, he, you, know how he, you know how he speaks to you through the word, right? And he encourages you with a word. Or, uh, you, you know, you read something and then boom, you hear it on the radio or something that comes back and it just comes alive to you. That's what God does with the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 17, uh, 3 verses 14 to 17 says this. But you must continue. That's an imperative. Okay. You must continue. In the things which you have, what? Learned. I, I don't know people that, that learn anything without reading anything. Okay? You'll never learn unless you read. Reading is what gets you to learn. Now, just reading and getting the information, like I said before, doesn't entail or, or doesn't uh, automatically make you a genius because you can have all the, the knowledge in your head. But what makes it powerful? When you experience it. Can I tell you why people don't cast out devils today? Because some of them got devils. Okay. The reason why some people don't cast out devils today is because they don't have the authority they should have it because God gave it to them, but guess what? They don't use it. They don't believe it. Well, you know, demons were for the time in the Bible. It don't exist today. Hmm? Come on. You'd be surprised how many demons cause all kinds of problems. He says... You have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Now, where did you learn them from? Church, right? Well, if you have a good, strong, biblical church that teaches you foundational doctrine, yes. 
But if you've got somebody that's just telling you to run up and down the aisle to a fire tunnel and all this other baloney, and you're just getting experiential stuff, guess what? You're not learning anything. That stuff will not keep you in the day of trouble, believe me. So God uses apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the edifying of the body, for the working of the ministry, so that you can be solidly founded on God's word. And can I tell you something? I know you appreciate this church now, but when you get my age and you look back, you're going to say, wow, wow, thank you, Lord, for the foundation I have because that foundation has kept me all these years. And I've seen people, believe me, I've seen people with, uh, with degrees and people that have gone to Bible school you know, and graduated from Bible schools, they're backslidden today because those things don't keep you. What keeps you is when you have a heart that's humble before God and you, hum you humble yourself before God and you say, God, I really don't know. I mean, God, you know, you bless me. You know, I'm with you. I'm, I'm here with you. I want to learn from you. I want to learn from your Holy Spirit. God, put teachers into my pathway, you know, that will teach me good doctrine, good things. Not some of these flake old, whack old guys that are out there. Yes, That's right. Amen. When you submit to the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is the keeper. Okay. Okay, so he says here, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. You believe that? Do you believe all scripture or just some? Now, are you sure? Okay, you're, sh you're sure that all Scripture is inspired by God. Is that true? Okay, then you have to explain to me when the devil talks in the Bible. Is that inspired by God? Someone's, Alicia, looking at me like this. Well, you know when the devil spoke to Jesus and said, you know, all this you, I'll give you if you come and fall down and worship me. Did God inspire that? So the devil is inspired by God? Who was inspired to write that? <laughs> Linda, the person that wrote it. Yeah, wow, that is an, that's, honey, that's deep. That's really deep. <laughs> that's real deep. Of course the person that wrote it. I'm testing you to see if you knew Yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, wherever it's located, whoever was inspired, they were inspired to write about that. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, okay? But not all Scripture is, that is being quoted by the devil or something like that is not inspired by God. It's just the writer was inspired to write about that. Okay, we got that clear. Okay, good. But you see how you can get fooled? I mean, you know what I mean? You have to know these things. You have to be able to think about these things. And that takes time, meditation. It takes, you know, concentrating on God and reading God's Word and using the tools. Okay, now, most of you got the Vines, you know, the Vines Dictionary. You got the Strong's Concordance. How many use it? Right? You have one, right, Brenda? I, get, I got you one, right? Yeah, you got to use it. You know, you got to use the tools. If you want to build a house, you got to use the tools. You got to spend time doing that. Uh -oh. Okay. The Bible has been given to us to make us wise, inspire faith, teach us how to live, equip us for our life's work and ministry. We receive this from the Word as we extract the timeless truths that are contained in the various accounts recorded for us. Okay, what is a, a moral truth or principle? Well, let's look at the dictionary's definition of that. Several ways. It's a lesson or a principle contained in or taught by a fable or a story or an event. It's a message conveyed or a lesson to be learned from a story. Uh, or uh, 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 It can be true or false. A concisely expressed a precept of, good, uh, of a general truth or a maximum or a moral and ethical principle that is drawn from a story or an incident. 
And so why do we need to apply the moral principle to Scripture? Why? Well, we need to apply the moral principle because not all timeless truths presented in the Word of God are clearly outlined. Sometimes we don't, you have to dig. You know, the Bible says the Spirit of God searches the deep things of God. Sometimes there's a deeper, a deeper um, meaning, okay? And you have to search that out. You have to search the Scriptures to see if those things are so. You have to be willing to study to show yourself approved. You've got to, you know, read it a little bit, a little bit more, not just take, the, take what it says, you know, at surface value. To give you an example, I think I gave you this example before. It says, uh, wives, submit unto your husbands. Ooh. Okay. And it says, by your chaste conversation, you will win them to Christ. Okay, and, and many believe that means yapping at them. <laughs> No, but the word conversation in the Greek means by your lifestyle, not by what you speak, but how you act. So, but if you read it on the surface, it looks like conversation. No, okay? Sometimes your husband doesn't want to hear. Okay? Sometimes he wants to see what you believe. He doesn't want to hear what you believe. Listen to me now, okay? Sometimes your husband doesn't want to hear what you believe. They want to see what you believe through your actions. Makes a whole big difference. So you see what I'm saying? Okay, so I won't belabel that. <clears throat> uh, Proverbs 25.2 says this, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Many things in the Bible tell us are presented in clear statements of truth, concise instructions, and unmistakable language. You can understand that, right? Be not unequally yoked with an unbeliever. That's plain and simple, right? That means don't get connected with an unbeliever. Okay? And that means single women, don't go get in a relationship, single man, don't go out and get a relationship with an unsaved person. Don't be unequally yoked for what has light to do with darkness and righteousness with unrighteousness. The Bible talks about that. So well, why is that so many disregard that? And they go and do it anyway. Quiet. However, much of what is presented is cloaked in a certain amount of mystery and must be discovered from application of the moral principle. So you have to look at that. No, she's done doing that all the time. Can we learn, or can anything be learned from a study of the various judges in the Bible? Yes. Are there many kings who ruled in Israel and Judah? Yeah. What about lessons learned from the life of Job or the book of Ruth or Esther? There are principles that you, some people say, well, the Old Testament is not for today. Yes, it is. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. There was no New Testament when he wrote that. So all Scripture, old and new, you can learn principles in things. Okay? Like, let's, let's, let's take for an example, and, I, and this is a moral issue. It is. When Saul was being confronted, and he began to fear, okay, and he was losing the king, he was losing being king over Israel, okay. So he was suffering loss. He was going through emotional trauma, okay. Instead of going to God, he went to a medium. He went to a, a, a seance. He went to a witch, the witch of Endor. Okay, what can we learn from that? that when you're going through a major crisis in your life, don't make decisions like that. <laughs> never, make an, never make an important decision when you're going through an emotional. See, these are things you can learn from these things. Don't make decisions, rash decisions. We'll, we'll see some of that in a little bit. But you follow what I'm saying? There's a moral principle there. Okay? Why did he feel he had to go to the witch? I mean, doesn't God know everything? Which doesn't know everything. God knows everything. And it was God who was taking him out of that, that position. But see, when we don't want things to happen, we panic. You know, oh, I gotta go get the I gotta get the I gotta get the answer. I gotta know, I gotta know, I gotta know. No, you don't know, have to know. Just trust God. Okay. How is the moral principle a biblical? Biblical interpretation applied. Well, the moral principle can be applied to nearly every passage in the Bible. 
The most common area to apply it to is the narrative portions of the scripture. This would include the historical sections as well as many of the miracles and parables of Jesus, like I explained to you. Okay. Parables of Jesus. How about the prodigal son? Right? Is there any lessons that we can learn from that? Is there any, any biblical truths we can take to that and apply a moral principle here? If I was to ask you the question, and most of you, have, how many have read the prodigal son story in the Bible? Okay, most of us, all of, all of us have read that. What is the one thing you picked out of that parable that the prodigal son probably lost? Right? What was the one thing? What was the one thing that the prodigal son had lost? Huh? No, what he lost. What is one of the things that he lost? Fellowship with his father, good point. Lost his dignity, anyone else? Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to think Jewish culture in your mind. Don't think American culture. Huh? No. He didn't lose it, he got it. His father gave it all to him. No. 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 Before he even left, what did he lose? We're talking about moral, uh, moral lessons here. What did he lose? He lost respect for his father. Do you see how you can get that from the scripture? Before he respected his father's decisions, okay, he, he sat under his father's authority. He was in his father's house. But there came a time where something went on inside of his heart where he began to question about his, his, his life and all that stuff, and he wanted his inheritance now. No, you, that's disrespectful. You go to your father and you say, I want, hey, before you die, Dad, I, I want my inheritance now. You know, I want my half of the house now. Can you give me the, you know, a couple of hundred grand, you know? I want it now. It was disrespectful. He lost that. See, these are some of the principles. If you read the scripture and you contemplate and you sit, you can get these things. And, and it applies. You go, wow. He disrespected his dad by wanting his inheritance. What happens, what, is the, what happens to the commandment? Honor thy father and mother. Not only did he lose sight of the respect and authority that, of his father, but he lost the respect and the authority of his heavenly father. You can take it deeper. Amen. I hope I'm giving you some shovel work. You know, Take the shovel of investigation and go into the scriptures and look at it. I'm not talking about adding your own interpretation, but I'm talking about taking moral principles that you can learn. Okay. What's one of the lessons he learned while he was on his, uh, on his backslidden ways? Huh? Humility? But what was, what was the one thing he came to realize? And that his father would still love him. Okay? And his father, he said, well, maybe I cannot be a son anymore, but I'm going to go back. You know, I'm willing to be a servant because I know the servants eat better than I'm eating right now in this pigsty, okay? Remember, he was Jewish. Okay? So here he goes walking down. There. You can imagine his heart's beating. Emotions are running high. Oh, boy. Devil's humming on his ear. Oh, your father ain't going to take you back. Look what you did. You squandered all that money on, on prostitutes and drinking and partying. And you're going to go back to your father now? How can he? He'll never forgive you. Look what you, all the hard work and all the years that he worked and he sweated and he toiled and you just took that money and you just wasted it. You're going to go back to him? He ain't going to forgive you. 
So as he's walking up, he looks up the top of the hill. There's his dad. And his dad sees him. And, and the Bible says he comes running after his son. And he comes up and he hugs his son. He kisses him on the neck. You know? Then he gives him the, the robe back and the ring on his finger, reinstates him as a son. What does that say to you and I? That when we mess up with God, guess what? If we'll humble ourselves and return back to the Father, he's there waiting for us to be restored back to him. Come on, somebody. See, you can get some real good stuff. Okay, not just read the Bible, just to read it for information. But it, this book is alive. It'll bring, it'll bring, it will bring life to you where it will change your life and make you into the person that God had originally intended for you to be. I get excited. I don't know, maybe I'm in a Baptist church or something. I, I get a little excited myself, you know. Huh? Baptist Hospital. Boy, you got some good answers today there, Alicia. The moral principle can be overlaid on top of all the other principles that we've learned. And while most of the other principles focus on gaining or extracting interpretation of the passage and its literal meaning, the moral principle focuses on timeless truths that are extracted from the correct understanding of that passage. How you can take that passage and make it applicable for your life today. You, you, can, you can find it. So let me ask you a question. We talked about a hyperbolic expression. It's an exaggeration, okay, without the intent to deceive you. Okay. Can anyone mention a hyperbolic expression in the Bible other than what I mentioned? Which, what about Revelation? That's a big book, 22 chapters. Okay, uh, you've got to be more specific. Well, that's not a hyperbolic expression. That's, a, that's a exact, exactly what he saw. A hyperbolic expression is an exaggeration without the intent to deceive. Can you think of any scripture off the top of your head, bottom of your head, around your elbow, somewhere? Everybody search. Some people are searching Google. Shame. <laughs> okay, there's one in Psalms. I don't know exactly where it is, but I, I, I know the story. David said that he wept so much that it made his bed float. How many of you have read that before, right? Okay. Well, that's a, that's a hyperbolic expression. It's an it's a, it's a exaggeration without any intent to deceive you. He's not trying to deceive you in really believing that he cried that many tears that his, float was able, his bed was able to float away. It's an exaggeration of the intensity of how much he was, he was sobbing and he was crying. So it's not an intent to deceive. It's just an, it's an attempt to show the depth of something that he was going through. And that's a hyperbolic expression. And there's others in the Bible, you just have to go look for them. I'm not going to show you and tell you where they are. You need to search the scriptures yourself. Amen. So the moral principle must never violate or come into conflict with the application or other hermeneutical principles and clear biblical theology. You can't, you can't make it... Uh, I'll give an example where a woman is told the pastor she's leaving her husband because she, she's going to marry another man because the Bible, she, she sought, sought Bible references, and the Bible references God takes away the first to establish the second. So she took that to mean that God's going to get rid of her first husband and give her a new one. Okay, Don't ever let that <laughs> kind of interpretation take place in your life. He's talking about the two covenants. He's taking away the old covenant to establish the first covenant, which is the old covenant, to establish the second covenant, which is the new covenant. Okay? So, but see, you can make it say whatever you want to. Amen. Come on. 
We can't do that. So one of the ways to assist the interpreter in coming to an understanding of possible moral principles is to utilize the list of character qualities in the appendix to this lesson. Now, I didn't check your book to see if there was an appendix of this, so what I did was, uh, it says, um, if you look in the appendix to this lesson, you are reading the passage, you can ask the question, does this passage teach us anything relating to alertness, attentiveness, attentiveness or availability, et cetera, et cetera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass these out, okay? I did it for you. So you can have them, and then we're going to go over them. So I'm going to kind of come up and just pass them out. One per family. Joe, would you do that for me, please? Pass them out there for me. I got 15. I think that's enough, but we'll see. <laughs> you got one for yourself, Joe? Linda? Are we all good? We all have one? Okay. Bobby, you need one? Okay, but do you need one? Because I have an extra. I have extra. I just, okay. Um, who can I get to run up there? There she goes. So if you look at this moral principles of these scriptures, if you look, I, I gave you quite a bit of them, okay? Um, if you want to look at the character, the definition, so let's look at um, let's look at a, at attentiveness. Uh, Hebrews two one. Put Hebrews two up, two one up there, showing the worth of a person by giving sincere attention to his words. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. So when you come to church and you hear a preacher, whether it's me or a guest speaker, always be attentive. Or, okay. And listen, showing uh, the worth of a person by giving sincere attention to his words. What's the opposite of that? Unconcern. So are you, con are you really are you, uh, giving more earnest heed to the things which you have heard? How can we test that to see if it's true? How can we test if you're giving heed to the most earnest things which you've heard? How do we, how do we test that? I know, it went right outside your head, didn't it? I just saw it go right out your head. Whoop! <laughs> it was there, and all of a sudden it just went, whoop, right out. Yes, Bobby. Okay, by reflecting, uh, I'll give a little more uh, in-depth definition to that. Not by just reflecting, but also <laughs> on how it is changing you. See, God doesn't just have everybody get together on Sunday. We all have a good time clap, sing a few songs, you know, hear a good message and go home. Okay? God has called all of us together, right? All right? For the perfecting of the saints. The word perfecting means for the maturity of. So God's called us to come together. We praise the Lord in corporality together. We pray corporately together. And now God calls, whether it's me or a guest speaker or whoever it is, to come up and give a message that's on God's heart for you. So it, is it just a message of, wow, that was a great message, Pastor. Praise God. Oh, yeah, yeah, praise God. And then two days later, okay, what did Pastor preach? Oh. How did it affect your life? Oh. But you can name the seven dwarfs. You can name, <laughs> come on, somebody, right? You can remember your fifth grade teacher. And, you know, I mean, come on now. 
Okay, what I'm saying to you is, is that when we come together, when we get a message from God's word, from God's heart to, your, to my heart, to your heart, it's for a purpose. It's not just to hear a message. And paying, therefore, ought to give more earnest heed. You need to heed because now too much is given. Much is required. Understand that the people in the world, they don't even have a clue about God. They don't have a relationship with God. And Father, in fact, the Bible says they are without God and without hope in the world. They have a religion and they have a God, but it's not the God of the Bible. Hello? He said they're without God. They're without relationship. And no hope. And here we are gathered together for what purpose? What reason? Yeah, we fellowship together. We love one another. Absolutely. Those are important things. But the main thing is when you hear God's word, and, and think about this. Every time you have heard a message, you're going to stand before God and accountability for how you handled that message. The Bible says you'll give account for every idle word you spoke. Come on, somebody now. Every word that you hear from this pulpit, you're going to give an account for when you stand before God. That should cause you to tremble at his word. Not because you fear judgment, because of, how, of his goodness and his love and his mercy. That's why we tremble at before God. We tremble. The Bible says trembling at his word. That's why we tremble at his word, because of the goodness of God and the mercy of God. And that if it wasn't for God, we'd all be consumed. That should cause a fear and trembling in your heart before the things of God. But, you know, you look at the church in the culture today, women coming in with halter tops on, shorts, flip-flops, coming in the church all kind of dressed, all kind of raggedy and all kinds of stuff. What, 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 what's happened? We've lost the respect of God. Our Father. Come on, somebody. See, we've allowed the culture to dictate to us. So again, look at some of these. You can look. I'm not going to go over all of these, but just a couple of these, okay? Um, let's look at First Thessalonians three seventeen for a moment. And you, I, and I want you to go through all these scriptures. I'm not giving you this just so you can fold it up and put it in your Bible or put it on a shelf somewhere. Not, no. Take these things and, and look them over. You got that scripture up? Okay. What did I, what did I tell you? Because I lost my place. Okay, 1 Thessalonians 3.17. There isn't one? Okay. Okay, Second Thessalonians. Okay, let's look at Second Thessalonians three seventeen. See if that's the one. How are we doing, guy? Okay, here we go. No, that's not it either. Okay, well, let's forget that one. Let's go to another one. I'll go to one. I got a couple that are outlined. How about First Corinthians fourteen forty? Let all things be done, say all things, decently, and what? And in order. Okay, so the character is, oddly, uh, is to do things orderly, and the opposite of that is disorganization. But it says, let all things be done decently and in order. But in order to put things in order, you've got to have what? Information, okay? Structure. If you're going to do something, you've got to have a goal. You've got to have a purpose, okay? So when you get up in the morning on Sunday, instead of fighting and arguing with family and all this other stuff about church and, you know, all this other stuff, shut that stuff up. Make, make yourself say, you know what? This Sunday when I get up, I'm not going to concentrate on any of that other stuff. I'm going to just 
put my mind, set my mind on God. And I'm going to church, and when I go to church, I'm not going in there to talk about this or talk about that or my favorite roast or whatever, or my new dress I bought or my new hat or my new shoes or my new whatever, okay? Or baseball or whatever, or my car or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm coming in prepared. I'm coming in. <laughs> Let me put it. <laughs> when you come to church, this sanctuary, this place, why are you coming here? What is your purpose for coming here? Well, I hope it ain't just to come to see me because someday I'm going to die and I won't be around anymore. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, now, let things be done decently in order. How are you going to, what order are you going to come and approach God? Flippantly? Hey, Jesus, here I am. I'm coming in. Jesus, you're going to give me what I need today, Jesus. No. Yeah, you're going to come in humbly, respectfully, gracefully, you know? You don't see none of that in the Catholic Church. That's one thing I give them credit for. You walk into a Catholic church, you can hear a pin drop. Because they, res they have a respect that's generational. That's God's house. I appreciate that about them. Are they doctrinally correct, incorrect? Yes. Are they mistaken in a lot of things? Yes. But that's the one thing they got right, is they, they approach God with a reverence. Now, of course, they leave there and go live their life and do all the things they want to do. But for that moment, they're in that place. I'm not that stupid. I understand what they do, okay? I was one of them. Yeah. See, I, I'm, I'm kind of a comedian. You know, I kind of break things up. If they would have said, I'm a Catholic, I said, oh, I, I have a Ford at home. <laughs> and she said, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? I said, oh, I thought you said you were a, ca a Cadillac. <laughs> Make them laugh a little bit, you know. And then you say, well, come on to church. I said, don't have to fear. You know, we worship God. Good. Praise the Lord. All right. But why do, you, why do we come here? We come here to worship Jesus. We come here to worship God. You know, I, I was telling Alicia today, I was texting to her, I said, I want to see our worship begin to be more in worshiping him rather than singing songs about what he does. You know, oh, he does this for me, or he does that for me, or he's good because he does this for me. No, I, I want more songs that we can worship him, directly to him, sing to him. You know, we've got some of the old Hosanna books. I got some of those books back, and I'm starting to go over them to relearn them again. You know, some of those old songs that, that they're worshiping God, you know. You know, like, oh, the glory of your presence. We, your temple, we give you reverence. So, it, you know, I don't know all the words because I haven't sang it in years. So arise to your rest and be blessed by our praise. See, he's, you know, don't walk out saying, I got nothing out of worship. You're not supposed to get anything out of it. If you do, it's a blessing. If you get touched, it's a blessing. But it's about him. It's about worshiping him. Amen? So those are some of the things you can do. So anyway, go through this list, Okay. Read, read, read some of the ones that are in there. We talked about that one. Okay, here's one. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3.1. If you look on there, it's, it's on page 150. It's the second one from the top. This might get some people a little angry. But... To everything there is a season. And a time to every purpose under the heavens. You believe that? 
How many believe that? Raise your hand if you believe that. To everything there is a season. It's not a trick question. <laughs> okay. To everything there is a season and a time and a purpose under heaven, right? For everything, right? Okay. So that means that God wants you to be punctual. Part of being accountable and responsible. If there's a time and season for everything, you need to be punctual. And if you're not punctual, guess what? You're a toddy. Okay. No, so, now I understand there's different reasons why people are toddy. Okay. But think about this. You're going, to be re- you're going to be late for the rapture? What if God says, you know, well, you know what? I'll just leave, leave him behind a little bit, you know, teach him a little lesson. No. God wouldn't do that, first of all. Okay. But being punctual, there's a time and a purpose for everything. And when you have time for church, and see some people, they have, and this really bothers me, church is an option to them. It's optional. Now, I understand that there are times when you, certain times you can't, something happens, you can't come. I understand that. But when I see continual... <sighs> But God's house is disrespected, not showing up on time. It speaks something about your life. We read, let all things be done decently in order. Okay. What would happen if you were continuously, repeatedly tardy at work? And I'm talking about consistently. That's right. They wouldn't stand for that. You get a warning. Okay, you work at Tyler's, one of the most strictest places on tardiness and staying absenteeism, right? I work there, I know. Okay, What happens if you're tardy and you go beyond the time they, they allow you? After they give you a verbal, right? Then they give you another verbal. So yeah, they have grace. Okay, But then you get a written warning. Then it's a day, is it a day or three-day suspension? I forget. But it's, one, it's a three-day suspension, then it's a five-day suspension. It doesn't go back to one warning, two warnings, one letter. No. After you have that gone to that extreme, then it goes to a five-day suspension, then I think, it's a, I think that's a, then it's termination. Out the door. Okay. So how do you prevent that? We sing that song, he's an on-time God. Oh, yes, he is. Well, if you want God to be on time for you, be on time for him. Amen. It's all, I mean, it's all part of doing things done decently and in order. Your priorities. You know, and I, when somebody from my church one time says, well, I can't help you. I got the kids and I got to do this and I got to do that. I says, well, when do you get them ready? In the morning, I'm driving, I'm walking around, I'm going around like a crazy woman. And I says, well, why don't you just prepare their clothes the night before? I didn't think of that. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you can do it. I'm sure, right? But, oh, get up to go catch a cruise or go to Disney World or go to Six Flags or go fishing. Guess what? Three o'clock in the morning, up, bright and ready. Here we go, man. Got everything going. Got all my stuff. Here we come. Let's go. We're ready. Come on, somebody. It's the truth. So read these things, but ask yourself, what's the matter? She's shaking her head. No, you weren't late today. But you weren't late today. You weren't late today. So you can do it. (laughs) Uh, Conditional obedience, right? No, what happens is you set your goals too high. Talk to Linda. She'll tell you about shortening your list a little bit. Okay. But again, it's what, you, what is your priorities? What is God saying to you? Is it important to you? Right? 
If you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, this is going to be number one for you. God's going to be number one for you. He, don't, he does not accept number two. Okay? You ever read this? You ever read? I, I, I posted this on Facebook, uh, Sinners in the Hands of Angry God. You ever read that? It's, it's on there. Go read it. You read that, you'll change your mind. Yes. Hmm. Okay. All right. So read these things and ask yourself the questions. How can I improve that in my life? How can I improve that? Yes, Tom. 1 John 3.17, write it down if it's, if it's a misquote. Put on 1 John 3.17 and we'll close with that. Probably that's, a few of those are typo errors probably. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion for him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Okay? So what that means is that you see a brother or sister and you, they have a need, Right? And you don't have any compassion for that brother. How can you say the love of God dwells in you? The one for compassion. You've got to have compassion. Okay. Now, I have compassion, but I'm not stupid either. Okay? Okay? I mean, I'll help, so I'll help you, Okay? But I'm going to help you, and I'm going to say to you, okay, now how do we change your condition, what you're in? How are we going to do that? That's helping. That's having compassion. That's having love. That's, you know, how can we change that? Let's see if we can do this. If we do this and this, this will do this. Okay? That's compassion. It's not just giving somebody everything they need, because what happens after that? They, you become their God. They lean on you. It says, lean on the Lord. Any Anytime a person begins to lean on, on you, you better run because God says, I'll have no other gods before me. Okay. And people can't can't lean on you. Okay. So that's that's the that's the scripture. That's right. That dwelleth the love of God in him. How does it do? It doesn't. You've got to have compassion. But again, getting back to the toddy and the and the, um, the on time thing, it's all priorities. It's all what's important. And sometimes, okay, some things happen. We understand that, but that should be the majority of your life. If God is the head of your is the head of your home and He's the head of of your of your life, that should be number one. Be on time. I can't stand being in Brazilian churches and Portuguese churches. They're always late. And I say, well, are they late for work? No. Well, why, why is it? Was work more important in God's house? Come on, somebody. I understand that sometimes things happen, you know, especially if you have kids, you know, you change their diapers, and guess what? I'm on the way out, they die. Oh, i got to change the diaper again. Those are, okay, those things happen. But there's no excuse. It all comes down to your commitment. Right? If you're committed. I'm not trying to point anybody out. I'm not saying that. But again, it goes down to what is important in your life. Okay? I'm sure if I told everybody I want everybody here, you don't think I'm not the Apostle Paul because you'd be stoning me to death. Really, I'm serious. If I was the Apostle Paul, okay, he would come out and he'd say, okay, uh, this Sunday I want everybody at church at 7 o'clock. We'll have a two-hour prayer meeting before service starts. They'd be like, huh, what? Seven o'clock. <laughs> I'm serious. Huh? Tough love. Is that what you said, tough love? Yes. <laughs> yeah? How would you like it? How'd you like it if the Apostle Paul said after your disobedience so many times he says, Oh, I'm gonna turn you over to Satan so that your flesh will be destroyed? Imagine a pastor saying that in church today, man, that, that church will, everybody will, I ain't going out of that church anymore. That pastor has no love. He turned that brother over to Satan, man. I'm getting out of here. But that's what Paul did. Brother wouldn't repent. 
Wouldn't make yourself right with God. That, that's, come on. How about, how, about, how about Paul when he told the, the Corinthian church, he says, that man is having sexual relations with his stepmother? Kick him out of the church. You can't do that, Pastor. He's got to have the love of Jesus. You know, He's got to be comforted. He's got to, excuse me, that's what the Bible says. After the first and second one, and kick him out. He doesn't want to repent. He's going to keep on doing what he's doing. Kick him. No, no, we just leave him there because you know what? Yeah, we got to collect the tithe and offerings. No, some church people may get mad at me on, on Facebook, but that's okay. Come on, somebody. Where's the discipline? We've become so lax in the church. We've allowed so much to come into the church. And you wonder why the Holy Ghost ain't moving like he did years ago? That's why. Because of our attitudes. We are the ones that bring the presence of God into a place. Not this place. It's your heart and when you come in here. You come in hungry for God and you want his presence and he sees you want that, he's going to come. He's going to meet you right there in the church. So God says, how bad do you want? You know, we hear revival. You know, we, we talk about revival. Oh, I want revival like the old days. Oh, we came to church. We were singing and dancing and shouting, running up and down the aisles. Praise God. I was speaking in tongues, having interpretation of tongues and messages. I want that back again. Well, how come we don't have it? We, that, who said that? Linda, you said that? We don't want it bad enough. We want to come and have the goosebumps and ducky bites, but we don't want to come spend an hour in prayer. We used to, when we were at the other church over there, 9 o'clock, we used to have people used to come and pray. You women used to come on Wednesdays to the church and pray. Those that didn't work that, you know, they used to come, pray, pray at the altar. God moved. We had great services. Well, how come we're not having it today? No more prayer. Come on Monday night prayer. It's, it's people are here. Well, a lot of people aren't here. Why? Because it's not important. What? No, but it's not important. It's not important. It's not important. But don't gripe when the Spirit of God don't move. Don't complain when the Spirit of God don't move. Yeah. The sister that was a missionary at the women's conference said, the reason why God's moving is because the people are desperate. And she said, how desperate are you for God? Mm. So what do we need to do? Moral principles. We need to examine the word, get the word in our hearts and in our lives and begin to walk it out. Decently in order, doing things decently in order, setting our priorities, setting our goals, doing things the way that God wants us to do them, and guess what will happen? God will move. God will shake. But be prepared because some people don't like to be shook. Some people don't like to be rocked. Some people don't like to be challenged. And so they go to the, comf the, the comfortable church, you know, the church of Dr. Willie Feelgood. Oh, the Women's Fellowship, anyone who wants to go, it's at 10 a.m. Starts at 11, you leave in my house at 10? Quarter past 10 at my house. Drive over to my house. I don't know how much is it, 10 bucks, something like that. Whatever, the church will pay for that. Don't worry about it. Women, you want to go? No, you can't wear a skirt and go, Bobby. <laughs> for who? Okay. Can we pray for Marissa?
Uh, Vicky's asking for prayer. She's working. Hi, Vicky. God bless you. We love you. Um, let's pray for Marissa. Okay, maybe that's, I know the Marissa we reached out to one time. I don't know if that's the same Marissa, but is Marissa on Facebook, Brother Bob? Okay. All right, Father, we just lift up Marissa to you right now, Father. We ask you, we send, we ask you to send the Holy Ghost to her. Whatever her need is, Father God, in accordance to your word, in accordance to your will and purpose and plan for Marissa, let it come to pass. Father, we pray for divine intervention. We pray, God, that the Spirit of God will move and break the, the, the portals of uh, atmosphere around her. God, if she's not a believer, we pray for her salvation. God, we pray, Father, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be upon her, God, and lead her and guide her, Father, by your Holy Spirit to salvation if she's not saved. And if she is saved, Father, we pray, God, that whatever she's asking, that, Lord, we believe with her, and we ask that you would bless her in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer. Any more questions, comments before we close? So we'll sign off to Facebook. God bless you. Thank you for watching us. And uh, God bless you, Linda, way up there in Maine. And uh, we love you. And uh, thank you for joining us. And Sa uh, Sa Sajiv in India. And uh, whoever else is watching, God bless you. We sign off from you now. In Jesus' name. Let's go. Father, we thank you.